All right, welcome to module number one, lesson number two of SISAS. And in this lesson, we're gonna talk about 802.1x, the extensible authentication protocol. Uh, 802.1x is not EAP, and EAP is not 802.1x. Oftentimes, these two components kind of get integrated together or we, we look at them together, but they're actually uniquely different uh, protocols and unique, uniquely different processes. They just happen to work together a lot uh, to provide authentication and so on. So we're going to take a look at in this lesson, you know, how does 802.1x help us uh, permitting or denying you know, de devices to be able to connect to the network? Uh, uh, how can we apply different um, uh, authentication and different authorization components and so on? We're going to talk about uh, uh, what is 802.1x in general? Um, what is the different what are the different message types that go back and forth when we're dealing with 802.1x? Uh, how do we provide for authorization? Uh, if we do VLAN assignments, what are VLAN assignments? We'll talk about the concept of a downloadable ACL. Uh, we'll take a look at the different 802.1x host modes. Uh, and what is the approach to deploying 802.1x? Obviously, we can't just simply turn it on. Um, because it, uh, it, it is something that needs to be tuned and configured. Uh, so we have different modes uh, of deployment, right? We can operate in monitor mode. We can do low impact mode. We can do closed mode. And uh, so we'll take a look at the differences between all those different deployment modes. Uh, we'll look at uh, what Cisco recommends as far as a deployment guideline. What is change of authorization? We've already talked about that a little bit in the first lesson. Uh, what is MAC authentication bypass? What is the extensible authentication protocol? Uh, what, is, uh, what are the different types of EAP, like tunneled, tunneled EAP versus non-tunneled EAP? Uh, we'll take a look at different non-tunneled extensible authentication types, tunneled authentication types. Uh, we're also gonna take a look at uh, kind of our traditional way of identifying in, endpoints. Uh, what is EAP chaining? What is EAP chaining operation? the flow uh, for corporate assets and users in EAP chaining, uh, when users log off, what happens, and then also if we're using some sort of network uh, uh, access, uh, what do we do with EAP chaining with network access, and then uh, personal assets versus, uh, you know, and uh, corporate assets using either third-party supplicants or uh, corporate approved supplicants and so on. So that would include the AnyConnect supplicant as well. It's a big lesson. There's a lot of stuff to cover in this chapter and uh, quite a bit on the exam about this as well. So uh, it's a highly technical chapter. We do talk, our lesson, excuse me, we do talk a lot about uh, the different extensible authentication options, which can be a little bit daunting, right? There's a lot of, there are a lot of options when it comes to 802.1x uh, and uh, the different extensible authentication protocols and so on, all right? So uh, let's go ahead and get started with uh, just kind of describing the overall um, protocol, right? 802.1x, as I mentioned previously, uh, is an IEEE standard. Um, and it's, uh, uh, you know, basically in this case, we're doing PNAC, P-N-A-C, which basically stands for Port-Based Network Access Control. Uh, it's part of the 802.1 group. Uh, it provides authentication. Uh, for devices that are trying to attach either wirelessly or, or over a wired network. Um, so we have the ability to extend 802.1x to wireless supplicants as well as wired supplicants. All right. Um, 802.1x defines actually the encapsulation of EAP. EAP stands for the Extensible Authentication Protocol. Um, and this encapsulation of those EAP messages is called EPOL, E-A-P-O-L, uh, which is basically EAP over the LAN. Uh, it was originally designed as actually part of 802.3 Ethernet uh, in the 802.1x uh, 2001 standard, uh, but it uh, has been adapted to support things like 802.11, uh, FDDI and so on. So there was uh, there's been some other updates to this. For example, 802.1x 2004 is where we saw the incorporation of 802.1x in the wireless networks. Uh, 
the EPOL protocol uh, is has been also modified uh, to incorporate the use of 802.1 AE, which is our MaxSec specification. We'll get into that a little bit later on, right? Uh, and then also 802.1 AR, actually. We don't really talk about 802.1 AR in this class, but uh, securing device identity using dev ID. Uh, and then uh, in 2010, 802.1 X 2010 uh, was uh, incorporated to support things like identification, uh, optional point-to-point -point encryption over the LAN, and so on. All right. So 802.1x involves basically three parties, and this is on the test. You can see it on the slide here. A supplicant, an authenticator, and an authentication server, which in this case is Cisco Identity Services Engine. The supplicant is basically the client device, like your laptop that, uh, or computer or whatever, that wants to connect to the network. Uh, you'll often see the term supplicant is kind of used interchangeably uh, to also reference the actual software that's running on the client uh, that provides you know the interface for us to incorporate or put in our our um, our credentials and so on but uh, uh, in terms of the overall architecture supplicant is really just the endpoint all right um, the authenticator what we call a network access device typically a switch could be a wireless access point, could be a wireless controller, uh, and the authentication server. They're going to be running probably most likely Radius uh, with extensible authentication. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the different options um, that, are, that are seen with uh, EAP implementations on the uh, authentication server as well. So the authenticator acts basically like a security guard to, to protect the network. So the supplicant uh, isn't allowed to access anything through the authenticator uh, to the protected side of the network until the supplicant's identity is validated and authorized, right? So with 802.1x port-based authentication, the supplicant provides different credentials, could be a name, could be a password, could be a digital certificate, could be some secondary authentication as well, um, to the authenticator, and then the authenticator forwards those credentials on to the authentication server uh, for verification. If the authentication server determines that the credentials are valid, uh, the supplicant, which is the client device, is allowed then to access the resources on the protected side of the network. All right, so we have uh, essentially tunneling, we're, we're essentially tunneling this extensible authentication protocol through uh, the use of ePoll messages to the authenticator, and then the authenticator is communicating to the authentication server using uh, radius or diameter or uh, very rarely TACX. In fact, we literally wouldn't use TACX in this case. Uh, and then passing those extensible authentication protocol messages back to the authentication server. Okay. Um, e, uh, the, the protocol itself, ePoll, uh, operates at the data link layer. Uh, it's encapsulated into Ethernet 2 uh, and it has an ether type of hex 888 echo. Uh, not that you need to know that, but you know, uh, if, you're, if you're troubleshooting and you're trying to identify different communication that's happening in the network, uh, you're going to see a type field of 888 echo. All right. All right. Uh, so you definitely need to know this, by the way. Uh, you need to know the different components of 802.1x that's on the test, uh, but it's pretty pretty straightforward. All right. Now there are some variations to the overall authentication process. Um, this slide kind of walks us through the different steps that are required during the authentication uh, and what is the progression of information that's going, um, you know, going to happen uh, during this process. I'm going to break it down. Uh, I, I would say that you probably don't need to really know all the specifics of this for the test, um, but you do need to know the basic four steps, right? The basic four steps is initiating or initializing the connection, uh, you know, then going through the initiation, then going through the negotiation phase, and then finally going through the authentication phase. So let me break that down a little bit. 
On the initi uh, initialization, uh, on the detection side of the supplicant, uh, the port on the switch itself, remember the, the switch is the authenticator, uh, in this case identified as the ED switch, uh, the port is enabled and set to what we call an unauthorized state. Uh, only 802.1x traffic is allowed. Other traffic like uh, regular IP traffic, TCP, UDP gets dropped. Uh, DHCP traffic would be allowed as well in this case um, because uh, it's... Uh, obviously important that the client is able to be able to, you know, is obviously able to to get an address and be able to participate in the network and so on. But overall, basic traffic is not allowed to pass through that uh, that particular port. That's the initialization component, right? And we kind of see that in the ePoll start message, the port is unauthorized, uh, and so on. Then we go into the initiation phase, right? To initiate authentication, the actual authenticator is going to transmit what we call an EAP request identity frame. Uh, we see that as the second block here uh, to a special layer two address. Um, and uh, I believe I'd have to look up that address. Uh, it is um, 0180 something. I can't remember the entire address. Let me uh, look it up real quick. So it's. Uh, it's 0180 Charlie 2 0000003. All right. It's a special MAC address that's used um, for this communication process. And it's going to send that over that local network segment. The supplicant is then going to listen for traffic on that address. Uh, and as soon as the supplicant receives that EAP request identity frame, it's going to respond with an EAP response identity frame. Containing uh, which contains the identifier for the supplicant could be like a user ID or something something that's going to allow us to identify the sup supplicant individually. The authenticator is then going to encapsulate this identity response, and it's going to put that into something called a radius access request packet, and it's going to forward that on to the authentication server. Uh, you know, if the supplicant for some reason doesn't get the initial uh, message, uh, the EAP request identity frame from the auth from the authentication device, the authenticator, uh, it can actually initiate um, by sending an EAP start frame to the authenticator, and that's what you actually see in this case. Uh, so it, it could be it, this is a process that could be initiated by the client, or it could be initiated by the edge switch. It just depends on the timing and so on. All right, then we move into what we call the negotiation phase, uh, which is actually called the EAP negotiation. Uh, the authentication server sends a reply uh, encapsulated in uh, what we call a radius access challenge packet. Uh, that's the uh, authentication server's response to this overall authentication request. Uh, and that contains uh, an EAP request uh, specifying what type of EAP method, right? What EAP uh, uh, based authentication I want the supplicant to perform. And we're definitely going to talk about all the different EAP options as part of this lesson. The authenticator encapsulates the EAP request into an EAP uh, EPOL frame. It transmits that to the uh, supplicant. And uh, basically at this point, the supplicant can start using the specific EAP method that was requested, or it can do something called a NAC, uh, N-A-K, uh, which is a negative acknowledgement, uh, and uh, meaning that essentially I can't support that particular method. And it can respond with the EAP methods that it can actually perform as part of the process as well. So as part of troubleshooting the overall extensible authentication process, you may look specifically for those NAC messages a negative acknowledgement indicating that I can't support the EAP method that you've uh, initially identified. Uh, and then finally we move into the authentication phase, right? Uh, if the authentication server and the supplicant do actually agree on a particular EAP method, uh, EAP requests and response get sent between the supplicant and the authentication server, obviously being intercepted and translated by the authenticator in the middle, until the authentication server responds with finally an EAP success message. That's going to be encapsulated inside of a radius access accept packet. Uh, 
uh, and uh, or or potentially a neat failure message, uh, which is an access reject packet, depending on whether or not we were authenticated. But if the authentication is successful, the authenticator sets the port to authorized, uh, and then normal traffic is allowed. Uh, if uh, it's unsuccessful, the port remains unauthorized, uh, and then obviously when the su supplicant logs off, it's gonna send an ePoll log off message to the authenticator. The authenticator then sets the port to unauthorized, and once again, it's blocking all of our non-EAP traffic on that particular port, okay? So that is the overall process. Like I said, you're probably not gonna need to know uh, that process as, as part of the overall, you know, you know, for the exam anyway. Uh, but, you know, it is, it, it's kind of a basic process. I mean, it makes sense. You know, you break it down to its individual components. The overall process kind of makes sense, all right? Now, uh, in, in 802.1x, obviously, we're gonna have some sort of authentication and authorization component for the clients as well. You know, are we going to assign the client to a particular VLAN using some sort of dynamic VLAN assignment method? Uh, you know, obviously if we're assigning a client to an individual VLAN, they're going to be uh, able to communicate over that particular VLAN based on that assignment. Uh, you know, we're gonna have different access rules, ingress and egress access rules for the VLAN. Um, and we can provide access control and auditing based on that VLAN assignment. We can also do what we call ACL assignment. All right, with an ACL assignment, the authentication server can associate an access control list with a individual user or a group of users, and then it can instruct the authenticator, which is the network access device, to dynamically assign this ACL to that particular session for that user. Uh, this is a much, much more granular approach to access control than just simply doing a basic VLAN assignment. We can also provide for time-based access, right? Uh, you're allowed specific access based on what time of day that you're accessing the information. And then we can incorporate the use of Cisco TrustSec. And we'll have a whole uh, chapter, actually several different chapters of lessons discussing the Cisco TrustSec architecture and what components are involved in that architecture, all right? Security group access, uh, or SGA, that's topology independent access control, meaning that uh, it doesn't matter where you go in the network, it doesn't matter what components or devices you're communicating across, the access control is gonna be ubiquitous uh, and it's going to apply across the entire organization. Uh, and we use that with, we, we use uh, security group tags, uh, we mentioned, they mentioned that here on the, on the slide here, all the trust set components. You've got uh, topology independent, scalable access control, classifies data traffic uh, based on your role, and then provides ingress tagging, uh, meaning the traffic entering the network using these security group tags, and then egress filtering using security group access control lists. And like I said, we'll see a lot more about that as we move on to uh, some of the future lessons, all right? When it comes to assigning an actual VLAN, when it comes to assigning an actual VLAN, there are many different types of VLANs that we have here. We'll talk about the assigned VLAN component first, and it really depends on, you know, obviously your authentication and your authorization. Uh, as to what VLAN you're going to be assigned to. Now the names of these VLANs are, are pretty, pretty easy to understand, um, but uh, uh, you know we'll break down some of these terms because on the exam you're definitely gonna have to understand the different applications of these different assigned VLANs. Uh, by definition, an assigned VLAN is, a, is specified by the authentication server and it gets sent back in that uh, access accept message that we talked about before. Uh, basically, this is assigning a VLAN for users that have successfully authenticated with the authentication server, uh, but it could be used essentially if authentication fails or you need to do some sort of device remediation and so on. So the assigned VLAN by definition is just whatever VLAN is assigned to the individual, right? Uh, it could be guest, it could be a remediation VLAN, it could be a, uh, 
uh, an enterprise VLAN for standard corporate access and so on. Uh, let's say the authentication server is configured to assign a VLAN based on guest users. So uh, when their uh, user authentication or Mac authentication bypass fails, maybe, we're, maybe the, the client doesn't have an 802.1x supplicant and the Mac address isn't in our Mac filter list, uh, then the, vest, the, the, the guest VLAN can be used to at least provide the device some basic access for internet and so on. All right. Um, the benefit, obviously, of using an authentication server to assign the VLAN is that uh, we don't necessarily have to just disallow that communication from that client onto the enterprise. We can give them some basic access uh, so they can potentially do some sort of remediation. They can identify, uh, you know, make, make some changes on their system to, to meet the policy requirements of our network and so on. All right. If we're assigning VLANs dynamically, obviously that's going to be more uh, manageable and more appropriate for the types of things that we're trying to accomplish uh, in overall, right, in the implementation of uh, security and so on. A guest VLAN, as you can imagine, uh, a user that maybe doesn't have an 802.1x client or they're denied access because they don't have the appropriate posture or they don't have the appropriate credentials and so on, we give them basic limited network access uh, and so on. Maybe some internet access and uh, basic email access or whatever it might be. If you have a guest VLAN and that's enabled on your 802.1x port, uh, we're going to assign the client to the guest VLAN. Um, uh, and uh, usually this will happen either because we don't have the appropriate credentials, or the client is able not able to support the EAP process or the AP information or the, the method that we've identified as mandatory, EPOL packages, packets are not able to be sent or so on. All right. Now, there is a distinct difference between the guest VLAN and restricted VLAN. Uh, restricted VLAN um, means that essentially the client was not able to authenticate. Uh, it's, uh, uh, as the book uh, mentions, it's called the authentication failed VLAN. Uh, Basically, if the device is not able to authenticate for whatever reason, uh, even if we can't authenticate through some sort of web authentication method, we're going to put them into this restricted VLAN. Uh, this VLAN is obviously going to be restricted from accessing other VLANs because authentication was not processed. Uh, and it allows users that don't have valid credentials uh, on the authentication server, maybe it's a contractor, a visitor to your network, to get access to a limited set of services. All right. Uh, now, that sounds a lot like the guest VLAN, right? Guest VLAN, limited access to services, uh, maybe a, a guest. But typically with a guest, guests could include contractors as well, where we give them maybe a little bit more access to the network resources than we might give to an individual uh, that can't authenticate and so on. Whether you decide to implement these different types of VLANs is totally up to whatever you're trying to accomplish in your environment for your deployment scenario. Uh, you don't, you're not necessarily required to have all of these different types of VLANs and it's not necessary uh, that you implement every option. It just depends on what your overall objectives are in your organization. All right. Uh, now, uh, in the process of authentication, the, uh, the switch itself uh, or the controller, wireless controller, if it's a wireless environment, which is the authenticator, is going to keep account of all of the failed authentication attempts. Uh, and if account exceeds the maximum permitted number for, uh, you know, for that particular configuration, uh, the port can move into a restricted VLAN state as well. Uh, and again, what's allowed based on that VLAN assignment is totally up to you. It just depends on whatever your policy is, whatever you've decided to implement, okay? The default VLAN, that's basically going to be the VLAN that's statically configured on the port. Uh, once a client successfully authenticates uh, to the server, if there is no dynamic VLAN assignment uh, by ICE, the default VLAN gets retained on the port. And then finally, we have critical VLAN, uh, which is also can be configured on the switch. That's applied to all of the 802.1x enabled interfaces if authentication 
if the authentication server is unavailable. So there is a distinct difference. I don't know that um, you would, of course, implement all of these different options, but uh, you know, it is something to consider. All right, and they will test you on that, right? They'll test you on the differences between the, the different VLANs. One of the components that we have available to us is to apply dynamic ACLs. Uh, DACL, D stands for downloadable, but essentially these are per user access control ACLs that get applied once the user has authenticated to the network. Uh, the authentication server maintains these downloadable ACLs once the RADIUS server authenticates the user that's connected to the 802.1x port, it retrieves uh, the ACL attributes based on the user's identity. Uh, and that's a profile that you're going to configure in ICE, and we'll see how to configure that a little bit later on. And then it's going to send that information to the switch. The switch is going to apply those particular attributes to the port uh, as long as that session, that EAP session, is active. Once the EAP session terminates, the switch is going to remove that per user ACL uh, and or if for some reason authentication fails or if a link down condition occurs. Uh, so for example, you unplug the cable from the port or whatever. The switch actually doesn't save any of these uh, ACLs. Uh, they're always downloaded on the fly whenever authentication occurs uh, and they're not saved in the um, running configuration either. When a port gets unauthorized, we remove all the ACLs from the port. All right. We already know that RADIUS supports user per user attributes, what we call the VS attributes or vendor specific attributes. Uh, and uh, these are sent in octet string formats, meaning that eight bytes at a time as a string set of string variables. Uh, and those get passed over to the switch line by line uh, as part of the authorization process. If you can imagine, an access control list is just simply a set of rules that either permit or deny traffic based on the actual rules themselves, like permit IP, uh, permit TCP, permit UDP, deny, etc., etc. So essentially, these are downloadable ACLs. They actually come in the form of INACL. Uh, which is interface ACL essentially. But as far as the rules go, pretty standard from an access control list perspective, right? We identify uh, you know, what's permitted or what denied, what's denied based on protocol, based on port number, uh, based on session information, uh, and then based on IP address and so on. Okay. All right. Um, one of the things that we didn't really talk about and I, I guess I should mention it, right? Uh, but um, we didn't really talk about the concept of the different supplicants. Uh, we, of course, we have the AnyConnect mobility client. That's obvious. But we also have different supplicants that are built into like the iPhone, uh, Mac OS X. Uh, Windows has their own supplicant. Um, and uh, Windows XP, Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows 10. Uh, there's also uh, Linux versions, different Linux supplicants, and so on. Um, so lots and lots of different options. Um, we'll see some of the supplicants that are supported by Cisco a little bit later on. Uh, but typically in a Cisco environment, we're primarily focused on the AnyConnect mobility solution. Okay. Now the next slide that we're going to talk about, very, very important slide. Uh, tested on quite a bit in the uh, context of the exam, so it's really important that you understand this. But also from an implementation standpoint, it's very important that you understand these concepts here. Right? It's called the host mode of 802.1x. Okay. Uh, now the host mode allows us to determine, you know, what a client is allowed to do once they're connected. Uh, well, no, not really authorization. I, I guess I should rephrase that. It's not so much what the client is allowed to do, it's what I'm allowed to do on the port once an individual device has been authenticated. 
All right, so when we talk about host modes, uh, in 802.1x, uh, a port's host mode is going to allow us to determine whether more than one client can be authenticated on a port and how authentication is actually supposed to be applied to that port. I mean, how is it going to be enforced? Uh, we can actually configure uh, an 802.1x port to use one of five different host modes. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in this particular section. Um, now, uh, the slide only lists four of them, right? Single host mode, multiple host mode, multi-domain authentication mode, which is MDA, and multi-authentication mode. Uh, but there's also actually a pre-authentication open access mode as well. And the book doesn't mention that one, but I'll, I'll talk about that one a little bit. All right, so let's talk about single host mode to start with. Uh, we can configure an 802.1x port for single host or multiple host mode. These are kind of one of the more common ones. Uh, in single host mode, uh, and we see that essentially on the right side, the very first diagram there. Uh, in single host mode, only one client can be connected to an 802.1x enabled port. Uh, the switch detects the client, sends the epoll frame, and when the port link state changes to an up state, that client is allowed to communicate. If the client leaves or gets replaced with a different client, the switch changes the port link state to down and the port returns back, basically back to an unauthorized state and uh, we have to go through the entire author, you know, initialization and authentication process again. All right. In multiple host mode, uh, we, uh, and we see that on the right side as well, uh, maybe two clients connected to a hub, connected to a port, although probably wouldn't see a hub, maybe it's another switch. Um, but in multiple host mode, we attach multiple hosts to a single .1x port. Uh, and then uh, the 802.1x port-based authentication uh, can be done. We typically see this in wireless deployments, right? Not so much having a hub connected to a port, but you might have an access point that's connected to a port. Uh, maybe it's not a, it's not a lightweight access point. Maybe it's an autonomous access point, and you have multiple wireless clients connecting to that access point. So that's more of a common scenario, all right? Only one, in this particular case, only one of the attached clients have to be authorized for all of the clients to get access to the network. If the port becomes unauthorized, um, maybe re-authentication fails, or maybe there was a epoll logoff message that was sent to the port, the switch basically denies network access to anybody that's attached to that port. All right. Now, if I was mentioning this from the perspective of wireless, right, replace that hub there with a wireless access point, uh, the wireless access point is actually responsible for authenticating the clients that are attached to it. So it acts as a client to the switch itself, if that makes sense. Uh, with multiple hosts, uh, if you have multiple host mode enabled, we can use 802.1x authentication to actually authenticate the port, and then we can use port security to manage the actual network access based on MAC address of the particular client. Does that make sense? All right. The next mode of operation, uh, this was actually a fairly new, well, I wouldn't say it's new now. At the time this book was published uh, in 2014, it was fairly new, 12.2, uh, I believe. Some. Uh, not uh, I forget what the subversion was, but somewhere at iOS 12.2, this was uh, introduced as a concept. Uh, what we call multi-domain authentication. Uh, basically, that allows, for example, and we can see that in the third diagram here, uh, it allows like a Cisco IP phone um, or a third-party phone uh, and a single host behind that phone to authenticate independently. Uh, so we use 802.1x. We use MAC authentication bypass or uh, for the host only, uh, web-based uh, authentication, right? The phone's not gonna obviously do any kind of web-based authentication. Multi-domain refers to essentially two domains, data and voice in this case. Only the two MAC addresses are allowed on the port, right? The switch can place the host into a data VLAN uh, 
and then it can put the IP phone into a voice VLAN even though they're actually physically connected to the same port. That data VLAN assignment uh, can be grabbed from the RADIUS VSAs, right, the vendor specific attributes uh, that are received from the authentication authorization process from the uh, ICE server or whatever uh, and so on. So a typical MDA application you'd have a single host behind an IP phone which is connected to an 802.1x enabled port because the client itself is not directly connected to the switch the switch really can't detect a loss of the port link if the client actually gets disconnected so in order to prevent maybe another device from using the established authentication of the disconnected client later the IP phone actually sends out a CDP host presence type length value field what we call a TLV that allows us to notify the switch of any changes based on the clients port link state does that make sense you don't need to know that uh, uh, necessarily for the exam but you know that's basic MDA uh, MDA mode multi authentication which is the last one we see on the slide here also available in, in iOS 12 too, so it's been around for a while, allows essentially one client um, on uh, the VLAN and, and maybe a, a client on the voice VLAN. The diagram here doesn't actually describe that. It simply has multiple clients connected to a hub, which is connected to our, our authentication switch, but it could incorporate the use of a phone as well. Um, so we might have one client on the voice VLAN and then we would have multiple authenticated clients on the data side. So if we have, for example, what we see here, a hub, or it could be an access point connected to a .1x port, multi-authentication mode gives us the ability to enhance security over multiple host mode because it's going to require authentication of each of those individual connected clients. Uh, if we have a non-802.1x device, we could use MAB or we can use web-based authentication as well as a fallback method for the individual host authentication. So we can mix and match whatever host authentication method we want to use. Uh, so we can identify different hosts, different methods through the same physical port. All right. Now, multi-authentication also supports MDA functionality on the voice VLAN uh, it does that by assigning authenticated devices to either a data VLAN or a voice VLAN, again, depending on the different VSAs that are received from the authentication server. One of the options that we don't see in, uh, in this particular case is what we call the pre-authentication open access mode. Uh, you're not going to be tested on this mode, but it is an additional mode. Uh, so we can take any of the four host modes uh, and they can actually be configured to allow a device to gain network access before the authentication process. This is called the pre-authentication open access. This can be useful if you have an application like uh, a PXE environment, pre-boot execution environment, where a device has to access the network to download a, boot a bootable image uh, um, and so on. Uh, we don't really talk about how to implement this. We use the authentication open option. We'll talk about the different authentication methods a little bit later on. Um, and uh, basically this acts as an extension to whatever configured host mode we have. So let's say, for example, I have pre-authentication open access enabled with single host mode. The port only allows one MAC address, but with pre-authentication open access enabled, Initial traffic on the port is restricted only by whatever other access restrictions that you have applied to the port are, independent of whatever 802.1x process you have deployed. Um, if no access restrictions other than 802.1x are configured on the port, the client has full access to the VLAN. So uh, I don't know if you guys will ever run into the scenario where you're going to have to configure this, this mode of operation, but... It is, uh, it, it is potentially a, uh, an option, right, if you're doing PXE boot or, or something like that. All right. All right. Um, let's take a break. Uh, 
and we're going to move into the next section after our break. Uh, we'll see you guys back here in about 15 minutes, all right? All right, one of the things that we have an option to do when we're deploying 802.1x is to deploy it in what we call a phased mode or a phased deployment approach. Uh, obviously, with 802.1x, one of the uh, problems with implementing it is that it is a new security feature. Um, actually, it's more than just a feature. It's a whole shift in how we apply security to our network. Um, so... It needs to be tuned, it needs to be, the process needs to be managed and so on. So we have three different modes of operation uh, where we can deploy um, 802.1x so that we can identify, you know, maybe some misconfigurations or, uh, you know, we, we, what, our goal essentially is to limit the amount of impact uh, that occurs when implementing this new technology, uh, new authentication authorization technology on the network. The phase deployment allows us to monitor the mode uh, first, uh, and then we can shift into like a low impact mode, or if we're, we feel comfortable with the way that the deployment is done, we can go directly into closed mode, uh, which is ultimately the mode that you want to end up in. The phase deployment typically uh, includes some sort of strategy to phasing in this technology across the organization. It could happen sequentially through different locations, different modules, or different components in the network, and so on. So let's talk a little bit about the different modes of operation and, and how these different modes look. You can see the configuration here. That would be uh, definitely something that they might ask you about on the exam. Uh, but the, the bottom line for monitor mode is even if authentication fails, we would allow access to the network. So why would we do something like this? Well, maybe we're trying to identify what types of devices we have in our network, whether the authentication methods are supportable with our endpoints and our clients, 802.1x, MAB, or, or web authentication. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that the clients support the appropriate extensible authentication protocol. Uh, and then also there's just a, a kind of a, a training perspective to this as well, making sure that the clients actually understand the processes that we're going through to change how clients are attaching to the network. So in this case, we're trying to simply identify uh, if the switches or the network access devices support the functionality, if the, uh, the clients themselves are 802.1x capable, uh, if there are valid credentials, uh, if the policies or the backend authentication server has been configured correctly, uh, in, if there's some sort of failed authentication event, does MAB kick in? Do we have valid MAC addresses and so on? Monitor mode is enabled in the 802.1x configuration uh, with open access by basically putting in one command, and that command would be the authentication open command. Uh, that's what's going to allow us to identify that the authentication is open. You can see that we've specified the host mode as multi-auth, we talked about that before the break. Uh, and then authentication port control auto turns on essentially the authentication process. Uh, and then we'll talk about what the other commands like MAB or .1x PAE authenticator represent a little bit later on. The goal here is really just to identify the modes. We're not necessarily looking at, uh, you know, getting into the details of the configuration. With low impact mode, we're able to add maybe a little bit more security by adding some sort of ingress access control list. You can see that we're still doing off open authentication. Oops, excuse me. We're still doing open authentication, but now we're applying this default ACL inbound to the port. Uh, that gives us the ability to maintain basic connectivity, uh, you know, apply some sort of level of security, but uh, at the same time, not completely closed off and certainly not completely open. We can use this procedure to provide the host uh, a default port, the ability for them to do DHCP, do DNS queries, maybe even get access to the internet, but at the same time blocking access to, uh, you know, very important or uh, critical network resources internally. All right. When you have a device, uh, a device, excuse me, connected to the switch, uh, the port authenticates the device and then based on that authorization policy, 
we can apply that off authorization policy. Uh, downloadable ACLs, dynamic VLAN assignments, security group tags, all the things that we talked about previously would apply here. But again, this is not fully closed mode. All right, the final mode of operation is closed mode. Uh, and this is really uh, ultimately where you want to get to. This is really kind of the default behavior that 802.1x should be configured with because it only ePoll traffic is allowed until the authentication process completes. Authentication is going to be required before you get any kind of network connectivity, uh, including DHCP. Uh, so timers are going to be really important here because DHCP potentially could fail based on uh, ina inadequate or inappropriate timer configuration. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Basically, the device connects to the switch port. It authenticates. Uh, the appropriate authorization policy gets supplied, again, using downloadable ACLs or dynamic VLAN assignments, security group tags, and so on. Uh, closed mode uh, was actually called high security mode previously. Uh, closed mode did not necessarily mean more secure. Uh, than implementing maybe, you know, some sort of authentication or authorization in low impact mode. So closed mode basically just means that it's closed. All right. So here's a diagram that kind of describes the different wired modes. Uh, the we got monitor mode, which is authentication open. You get full access to the network. Uh, you've got uh, low impact mode. Uh, we have open authentication plus a pre-applied ACL. So that can provide either full access or you could potentially, after post-authentication, apply some sort of downloadable ACL in this particular scenario. And then finally, closed mode, no access, only ePoll messages are allowed. Post-authentication, again, downloadable ACL or some sort of full access in, uh, in that scenario. So uh, you will have to know the different modes of operation for the exam, of course, uh, but these are the three different options. Andy, you had mentioned that you guys are running ICE. Are you uh, uh, obviously implementing 802.1x? What Did you guys start with a monitor mode in this case? Um, are you still operating in monitor mode? Or did you simply go from low impact to closed mode? Or do you know? No, we, we, we did the... Uh we start off in monitor mode, right? Uh, and then, uh, and then just I mean, it, it was. It, it, we're not a large organization, but it probably took us about three weeks to go from monitor mode to to closed. Yeah, you skipped the low impact mode altogether. Well, I mean, yeah, it was. It was a. Yeah, we we, just, we really kind of skipped the low impact. What kind of things did you identify in monitor mode? I mean, uh, were you able to identify devices that couldn't authenticate or you just didn't have the right policies or credentials or, or whatnot? I'm just curious. A little bit of everything. A little bit of everything because I know that you're, with ICE, as you start to go through your posturing and, and, and stuff like that, you have to be, you need to know exactly what, what you're dealing with. Right. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you're, you're going to have a, you're going to have a printer that, uh, that, that will never get on the network, right? So exactly, exactly, a printer or a stamp machine or you know whatever, right? Things that you don't always think about, uh, and you can't. Uh, you, if you just operate in closed mode from the start, you're going to have a lot of devices that can't communicate at all. So, yeah, interesting. All right, uh, what are some of the guidelines? Uh, 802.1x can be implemented using uh, obviously the phased model. Uh, it allows for uh, ideally the least amount of impact on the overall production of the network so that you can gradually kind of introduce all these security mechanisms into your environment. Uh, generally, in most cases, and we do this a lot with our customers, Andy just mentioned that they did this as well, is to deploy in monitor mode in a specific area of the network. Uh, and and we, this is basically our auditing phase. We're just trying to identify what's going on with the network, what kind of devices we have, if we're getting some failures, why are those failures occurring? Maybe our posture, our profiles aren't set up correctly in ICE. Uh, you know, certain aspects of authentication that we may have thought we considered weren't considered in the deployment, and so on. Um, we get visibility on who can succeed and who can fail, uh, and then based on failure, what are the what are the reasons that the failures occurred? Uh, 
what kind of remediation are we seeing? Um, you know, uh, are we prepared to move into a stronger enforcement scenario based on the current position of or current posture of our devices in the network? Uh, we may decide that we have to go and manually, um, uh, you know, uh, remediate a lot of these devices in the network because they, they're just so far off of what our standard baseline policy might be that implementing 802.1x with, with profiling and posture assessments and remediation through ICE is probably not very practical initially. There's a lot of baseline configurations and whatnot that we might have to apply. Before moving from monitor mode into a stronger enforcement mode, we have to decide if, if low impact mode is gonna be our next step or if closed mode is gonna be our next step. And that really just depends on your organization, what your overall goal is with the security architecture, what your security policy requires, and so on. Uh, and the timing could be uh, extensive as well. I mean, Andy mentioned in a smaller organization, it took over three weeks. Uh, it could take potentially months, depending on how many endpoints and the diversity of endpoints that you have in your network, um, uh, you know, which would apply or require you to apply different uh, approaches. Um, you might use uh, closed mode in maybe remote, small office or home office implementations, branch office locations and so on, and decide to use like low impact mode at your corporate offices uh, because of the potential impact to loss of service or loss of connectivity based on the importance of the resources at that particular location. After you successfully deploy the different phases, uh, after a specific amount of time, you'll then move into the next phase of operation. So you go from your audit phase, you can move into your enforcement phase, right? Where you can extend uh, uh, whatever policies and so on you might have uh, to your organization based on what you've decided to implement. As we discussed in a previous section here, traditional RADIUS allows for the clients to make AAA requests to the RADIUS server, um, but it's a dynamic environment. Right, especially if we're doing uh, device posturing and, and device remediation. What might be uh, appropriate level of access at one point in the network might change potentially to a different level of access and uh, you know, after we've gone through some remediation and so on. Uh, this is where change of authorization comes into play. Right? The circumstances changed. Traditionally in RADIUS, there really wasn't a mechanism to dynamically change the client's uh, authorization policy um, based on that change, uh, but RADIUS COA was added, uh, like I said, in RFC 5176 to uh, include this change of authorization process. So if you look at the diagram here, we'll walk through kind of the step steps here. The initial state, the switch port gets, uh, um, you know, it is in an unauthorized or unauthenticated state. Uh, the ACL is in place on the port, allows basic network functionality, if you don't authenticate, so you might allow DHCP IP address assignment, uh, TFTP configurations if there's a phone attached to the port and so on, maybe Active Directory authentication, uh, and absolutely 802.1x authentication, ePoll messages. So the endpoint connects, uh, the user authentication process takes place based on 802.1x, that completes successfully. That's step number one. All right, and step number two in this particular slide. All right, so now we've identified or we've authenticated. Uh, we have an initial authorization policy, which allows basic connectivity, maybe, uh, or no connectivity if we're simply doing posture assessment and device remediation. So I sends over a radius uh, access accept message to the switch, uh, specifying the authorization policy that allows connectivity to the ICE, uh, to do the posture assessment, and then IP connectivity for remediation to our remediation server if the posture assessment fails. Uh, and then we'll apply that policy dynamically to the switch port using a downloadable ACL. Uh, step number four, once we complete our posture assessment, if the endpoint is compliant, then we move into a change of authorization. The change of authorization message is sent uh, to the switch by the uh, RADIUS server or the RADIUS the radius component in the ICE server, uh, then th that changes the authentication of that port based on the context of the uh, remediation. That change of authorization might not happen immediately. We might 
uh, or it might not include uh, you know, full access. Change of authorization could be simply change the level of authorization to allow for some sort of remediation. Um, but, but in the end, uh, overall the goal here is to um, you know, obviously identify what level of access the client is allowed to have based on you know, whatever posture or profile they have in place at the time. All right, so it's a kind of a generic sense. Mac authentication bypass, uh, it's um, you know, kind of a, a really basic concept. 802.1x basically has three uh, entities as we talked about before. We have the supplicant, we have the authenticator, uh, and we have the authentication server. Now typically, you have a host PC that's running the supplicant software. It tries to authenticate itself by sending credentials to the authenticator, and then that authenticator in turn relays that information to the authentication server for authentication. Problem is that not all hosts have that supplicant functionality. Devices that can't authenticate themselves using 802.1x may still need to have some sort of network access but they don't have the supplicant that provides that feature. So we might have to use something like Mac Authentication Bypass. Basically, it uses the device's MAC address to grant or deny access to the network, all right? Typically, we're gonna use this feature for ports where devices like printers are connected, uh, or, or really any device. It could be a scanner, you know, like a barcode scanner. It could be a, a stamp machine you know, that uh, is used to, for mail, in the mailroom or whatever. But it's basically any device that doesn't have an 802.1x supplicant capability. In this deployment, the RADIUS server maintains a database of all the MAC addresses that require access. When the feature detects a new MAC address on a port, it generates the RADIUS request with the username and the password as the device's MAC address value, all right? So after the authorization succeeds, the port then is accessible to that particular device through the same code path, essentially, that 802.1x authentication would take when processing, basically, an 802.1x supplicant. All right. Now, if authentication fails, the port, of course, moves into a guest VLAN, or it just simply remains unauthorized. Uh, certain types of devices, for example, like um, uh, the Catalyst 4500 can also support re-authentication of Macs at the port level. Uh, re-authentication functionality is, is part of 802.1x, but it's not necessarily MAB specific. Uh, the port stays basically in the previous radius sent VLAN, tries to re-authenticate itself, uh, if that reauthentication succeeds, the port stays essentially in that radius send VLAN. Otherwise, again, the port becomes unauthorized and moves either to a guest VLAN or whatever. All right. Now there is a uh, there are a couple of considerations. They don't really talk about this on this slide, but I think it's important to make a note of uh, is that uh, there are certain feature interactions and restrictions if you have. MAC authentication bypass enabled. Um, you can assume, based on what I'm going to tell you right now, that if I don't mention a particular feature, that the interaction works with um, MAC authentication bypass. Keep in mind that MAB can only be enabled if 802.1x is configured on the port itself. It's not something that we can configure secondarily to 802.1x. Uh, the MAB function also is a fallback mechanism for authorizing MACs. If we configure both MAB and 802.1x on a port, the port attempts to authenticate using 802.1x. If for some reason the host fails to respond to the ePoll message requests and we have MAB configured, that .1x port gets opened up to listen to packets to grab the MAC address rather than simply going through the process of trying to authenticate using 802.1x over and over and over again, all right? Based on whatever 802.1x timers are set, the transition between the, max, the between that 802.1x 
authentication process and the MAB process is about 90 seconds. We can shorten that time uh, by changing the value of the transmission period time, but that's also then going to change the, the frequency of how often we're sending out ePoll messages. A smaller time, a timer means that more ePoll messages are going to be sent in a shorter amount of time, obviously, which is a little bit more overhead. If we have MAB enabled, 802.1x performs one full set of ePolls. Uh, and then the learned MAC address is then forwarded to the authentication server for processing after that, after that fact, right? Uh, we do authorization first based on the MAC address detected on the wire. The port again is considered to be authorized once a valid MAC uh, address is received that RADIUS is going to approve of. All right, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, if for some reason, authentication failed VLAN is used, right? So instead of just simply deauthorizing the port, if we use some sort of authentication failed VLAN, uh, MAP does not, let me, let me rephrase that, okay? Let's say that uh, I have both .1x and MAP configured on an interface and the .1x process fails. MAB is actually not attempted with those .1x authentication failed users. Basically, the, the port itself moves directly into an authentication failed VLAN, whether or not MAB is configured. Now, if I have both MAB and guest VLANs configured and no ePoll packets are received on the port, then what happens is the 802.1x state machine moves into the MAB state, it opens up the port again to listen to traffic, to grab that MAC address, and the report actually remains in the state waiting for a MAC on the port. It actually doesn't transition back to the 802.1x state. Uh, a detected MAC address that fails authorization will obviously cause, I mean, based on the MAC address itself, will obviously cause a port to move into the guest VLAN if it's configured and so on. All right. Once a new MAC has been authentic authenticated by MAB, uh, the responsibility to limit access for that part port falls on the authenticator, uh, whether it's port security or whatever. Uh, in 802.1x, the default parameter is defined only as a single host. We talked about that option previously. Uh, but if you want to allow multiple MAC addresses to the port, you have to change the, the mode of operation. All right. So just uh, just some, some things to consider when we're talking about MAC authentication bypass. All right. All right. So we've got uh, about 15 minutes left before we're going to break for lunch. Let's go ahead and get into one more discussion prior to the break. Uh, which is really talking about the extensible authentication protocol. Now, the extensible authentication protocol, it, uh, it, it's actually a framework, right? Um, and uh, it, it is quite involved, actually. And we're going to talk about uh, a lot of different components of this as we move through uh, future lessons. But right now we're just kind of introducing the concept. Uh, there are many, many different ways of uh, performing EAP. There's many different forms of EAP and so on. Um, it isn't a framework, which means it's not a specific protocol, but it's a framework of protocols. Uh, and uh, it's used in, like I said, wireless networks, point-to-point uh, -point Ethernet connections and so on. Uh, there was an original RFC for EAP. It was developed uh, in, I don't remember the time frame, but it was uh, RFC 2284, uh, but that's been replaced with RFC 3748. Uh, and then again, it was updated in RFC 5247 as we came up with some additional EAP methods. EAP is basically an authentication framework. It provides for the transport uh, the use of keying materials, different parameters generated by depending on the different EAP method that you use. There are lots and lots of different methods defined by many different RFCs. Some of them are vendor specific. Uh, 
uh, and some of them are open standard. Uh, it is not a wire protocol, um, meaning that it's not an actual protocol where you're going to be able to see a capture in Wireshark or something like that, and you have a specific format for the headers and so on. It's basically just a defined group of message formats. Uh, each protocol that uses EAP defines different ways to encapsulate EAP messages uh, within the, that particular protocol's messages themselves. Uh, in 802.11, WPA, WPA2, uh, they have obviously incorporated the use of 802.1x, uh, actually hundreds of different types. I mean, we've got uh, lightweight extensible authentication protocol. We've got uh, EAP transport layer security, EAP MD5, EAP protected one-time passwords, EAP pre-share key, EAP password, uh, EAP IKV2, um, EAP GTC, which is generic token card, uh, and I mean, there's just many, many different types, many different types. Uh, like I said, it's a framework. Um, it's not a specific authentication mechanism. Uh, it provides common functions and negotiation of different authentication methods. These are called EAP methods. About 40 different methods are actually defined already. I listed a few of them, but, uh, and we're not going to go through all of them in this class because it would be way, uh, way too much uh, information. But so like I said, there's lots and lots of different options. You are going to have to know about Leap. You're going to have to know about EAP TTLS. You're going to have to know about EAP TLS. You're going to have to know about EAP GTC. Um, you're not going to have to know about other versions. I mean, again, there's over 40 different versions. Um, and all of them kind of do things a different in a, in a little bit of a different way. So uh, that's ultimately what what um, our goal is to identify some of those those options. And we'll see what the differences are and so on. But uh, that's basically an overview. Um, you know, the book mentions that the main advantage of EAP uh, is that it's extensible to implement basically any authentication process depend you know independent of whatever it is that uh that it is you're trying to accomplish right uh and because it is a framework it's kind of like saying the ipsec framework right it's you can choose to do esp you can choose to do ah you can choose to do md5 you can choose to do sha uh you can use different confidentiality mechanisms and so on well eep is a very similar concept very similar process. All right. All right. Uh, tunnel versus non-tunneled EAP. Uh, obviously, non-tunneled EAP architecture. We see that listed here at the top. In a non-tunneled EAP architecture, the EAP session exists between the supplicant and the authentication server. The supplicant sends its, identi its identity or its name in the clear to the authentication server, which could be a security risk. I mean, if you're running it internally inside the network, maybe not so much, but externally, uh, it could be a risk. Uh, and then after I've identified myself, I go through the exchange that authenticates in a, uh, the user and goes through the authorization and so on. All right. Um, the problem with this particular process is once we're authenticated uh, and the authentication server sends back the message to the authenticator through the RADIUS protocol, um, some of this information is sent in the clear. Very simple to understand, but the user's identity, not the credentials, not the actual password, but the user's identity is sent in the clear. Uh, it, like I said, if you're implementing this internally inside your enterprise, it may not be a big concern, but if you're implementing this outside the enterprise, this could be more of a concern. To overcome these limitations, we had the implementation of uh, what we call tunneled EAP or EAP inside uh, another EAP tunnel. So we use the external EAP tunnel to conceal or obfuscate the user identity, and then we use the inside EAP tunnel to actually pass the, the EAP, uh, EAP information securely and confidentially. All right. EAP, uh, for example, you can see two examples, PEEP and eat fast. So I'll talk a little bit about these. Even though we're not 
we don't necessarily need to get into the specifics of each one of these. I'm going to uh, I'm going to I'm going to go into a little bit more detail than I normally do on these particular methods and then we'll break for for our lunch. But uh, uh, PEEP and EAP fast, EAP MS chap V2, EAP TLS, EAP GTC, uh, uh, those would be um, sorry, EAP MS chap, EAP TLS and EAP GTC would be some of the tunneling methods I would use in turn in inside the outer tunnel. The outer tunnel would be PEEP and EAP fast. All right, so let's take a look at some of the differences between the, uh, the different types of um, protocols. And uh, we'll just talk a little bit about some of the differences here. I'll start with uh, EAPMD5, uh, and then I'll, I'll get into some of the other ones. EAPMD5 uh, is an IETF standard track. It's not an IEEE standard track based on the EAP method. Uh, it was defined uh, originally in the very first implementation of EAP, RFC 2284, but very minimal, minimal security in this particular case. We basically use MD5 hash functions, um, which are vulnerable to dictionary attacks. Uh, we don't support uh, key generation, basically unsuitable for use of things like dynamic WEP or WPA or WPA2 Enterprise. Uh, so it, it, it has some limited applications. EAPMD5 does differ from the other EAP methods in that it only provides authentication of the EAP peer to the EAP server, but it doesn't do mutual authentication, meaning that we, we won't authenticate um, the client to the server and the server to the client. By, by not providing, we, we do client to the server. What I'm saying though is we don't provide server to client authentication. Because we're not providing that server authentication, this uh, particular method is vulnerable to things like man-in-the-middle attacks and so on. Uh, this is an older version, uh, introduced in Windows 2000, uh, but was uh, deprecated actually in, in Windows Vista. So we really shouldn't see this version uh, anytime, really, uh, in, in uh, modern networks today, all right? Uh, another one that you'll see is EAP MS CHAP V2. Uh, much like EAP MD5, uh, the only difference is it provides bi-directional authentication. Both the client and the server credentials can be authenticated, uh, and it can work with like Mac Microsoft password hashes instead of uh, uh, just basic passwords. So domain passwords, uh, Active Directory passwords and so on can be utilized. Uh, it's recommended for authentication architectures if you're going to use some sort of plain plain tax plain password authentication, um, and it can be deployed over untrusted channels because of its security. All right. Now, EAP TLS uh, is one of the more common EAP methods that we see today. All right. It's called EAP over transport layer security, again defined in RFC 5216. It's an IETF open standard. It uses the transport layer security protocol, uh, and you know obviously TLS is going to be widely supported uh, with you know um, wireless networks and so on. Uh, it was actually the original standard wireless LAN EAP authentication protocol that existed in wireless domains. It's still considered one of the most secure EAP standards available. It provides strong security, but only as long as the user understands the potential warnings about things like false credentials. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about EAP TLS, it's pretty much universally supported by all manufacturers of wireless LAN hardware, LAN software, and so on. Up until April of 2005, EAP TLS was actually the only EAP type that we used to certify uh, WPA and WPA2 and so on. Uh, so we do see this a lot in reference to wireless environments. There are client and server implementations of EAP TLS. Lots of vendors support it, Cisco, Avaya, uh, Foundry, and so on, Microsoft, Juniper, etc. Uh, it's natively supported in Mac OS X, uh, Windows 2000, Windows XP, Mobile, CE, obviously Windows 7, Windows 10, etc. 
All right. Unlike though, you guys are probably pretty familiar with the uh, the use of say TLS in in like an HTTPS environment. Unlike most TLS implementations, uh, like you see with HTTPS, uh, EAP TLS does require client side X.509 certificates uh, without really giving you the option to disable that requirement. So that's a test question, by the way, or could be related to a test question. It does require client side X.509 certificates. Even though the standard doesn't mandate the use, uh, in uh, the realm of 802.1x, it's required. Uh, some have kind of identified this as a, uh, a potential to reduce EAP TLS because of the need to have these certificates, um, but uh, it, is, it is part of the requirement, all right? Uh, let me see, is there anything else I want to say? Uh, you know, obviously the, the, the need to, re, to, to support a client side certificate uh, is actually what gives EAP TLS its authentication strength, right? Uh, and it demonstrates the difference between convenience versus security. We always talk about that in the realm of security. You know, uh, there has to be some sort of trade off between classic convenience and then the security, right? When, you, when, when you're refor forced to use a client-side certificate, a compromised password, for example, would not be enough to break into this ETLS enabled system because the intruder would still have to know that client-side certificate. Uh, in fact, a password's actually not even really needed uh, the password technically is only used to encrypt the client-side certificate for storage. Um, the highest security becomes available when you're using private keys on the client-side certificate and those are actually stored on like a smart card. There's actually no way to steal the client-side certificate um, and the corresponding private key from the smart card without stealing the card itself. So there's some benefits. Um, you know, to, to this particular method. Uh, another method is EAP GTC, and uh, th that is uh, EAP Generic Token Card. Uh, it's an EAP method that was created by Cisco. Um, it was actually developed as an alternative to PEEP and EAP MS Chat V2. Um, defined in RFC 3748. I mean, it was actually part of the original RFC, 2284, but in that secondary RFC, 3748, it was defined. Uh, what EGTC does, and we'll see more details about this a little bit later on though, it carries a text challenge from the authentication server and a reply gets generated by the security token. And we'll, again, if you don't understand what that means necessarily right now, that's okay because we will get into that discussion in more detail a little bit later on. The PEEP GTC authentication method allows for generic authentication to things like LDAP, one-time passwords, even Novell uh, directory services and so on. Um, and it is, uh, it, it is very simple, basic EAP type. Sends this clear text password or one-time password to the authentication server. Uh, it's the only protocol that supports one-time password authentication as a client credential, and it should always be tunneled inside of PEEP read fast because that simple EAP, uh, that password is sent in clear text. All right. Now we've got two other EAP methods that we'll talk about. We've got EAP fast and EAP PEEP. Or PEEP. All right. So let's talk about EAP fast, and, and then we'll get into PEEP a little bit later on. Actually, we'll talk about both of them right now, but like I said, we'll get into the details of this uh, in, in further lessons. Remember, these are the external tunnel types that we can use to encapsulate the internal tunnel information. Uh, let's start by talking about EAPFAST. Uh, flexible authentication via secure tunneling, uh, RFC 48... Oof. 
trying to think. 48, 50, 50 or 51? Probably 48, 51. I think it's 48, 51. Also, uh, Cisco Standard uh, was designed actually as a replacement to Leap, the lightweight extensible authentication protocol. Uh, really designed to address all of the weaknesses that Leap had built into it, but also at the same time allowed us to preserve that quote-unquote lightweight implementation. We use server, uh, the use of certificates, for example, like specifically server certificates is optional in EatFast. Uh, and and uh, you might think, well, then how could I potentially, how could I authenticate the server if I'm not using certificates? Well, EatFast makes use of something called a protected access credential or a PAC to establish the TLS tunnel uh, where the client credentials get verified. There's actually three phases to EatFast. Uh, we don't really need to get into the specifics, but I'll uh, kind of break them down. Obviously, provisioning is the first phase. We call that phase zero, actually. Uh, it's called in-band provisioning. So phase zero is what we call the in-band provisioning phase. Basically, we provide a shared secret. Uh, the shared secret um, is actually going to be used in phase one, which is the actual tunnel establishment. So basically what happens is we use um, Diffie-Hellman, uh, authenticated Diffie-Hellman actually. Uh, and the purpose is really to uh, eliminate the need for a client to establish a master secret key every time I need to get access to the network. But we move into phase number one, which is the tunnel establishment phase. This is where we authenticate using the pack and we establish the tunnel key. Uh, the key establishment allows us to provide confidentiality and integrity during the authentication process of phase two, uh, which is the final phase, phase two. It's three phases, remember, zero, one, and two, which is the authentication phase where we actually authenticate the peer. Uh, we have multiple tunneled, uh, different secure uh, secure authentication mechanisms. These are the ones that I had mentioned previously, right? When you have automatic pack provisioning enabled, EatFast has uh, actually, a, a Cisco's documented this, a slight vulnerability where the attacker can actually intercept the pack and use that to compromise user credentials. Uh, so what we do is we simply use manual pack provisioning or we use server certificates for the pack provisioning phase. Uh, I don't know that it's necessary that we get into the specifics of the vulnerabilities of this EPFAST process, but I did want to mention that. I was reading a document on Cisco's website about that uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, about this automatic pack provisioning process. Uh, the pack itself is actually issued on a per user base basis. Uh, when, if a new user logs on to the network from a device, that new pack file has to be provisioned for that user first. Uh, this is kind of why it's difficult not to run EatFast in kind of an anonymous provisioning mode uh, because it's really difficult to, to do manual pack provisioning. And then, of course, if you incorporate the use of certificates, that kind of eliminates the whole need or the whole purpose of having a lightweight process in the first place. All right. Uh, if you use EatFast without pack files, basically it just becomes EPTLS, essentially. Uh, it's natively supported uh, uh, in OS X 10 and beyond, Windows Vista and beyond, and so on, um, and uh, quite, quite widely used and widely adopted. All right. Uh, and then finally, the last one we talk about is PEEP uh, and... Uh, PEEP is the um, other tunneling protocol that allows us to tunnel an inter-EAP method, EAP, EAP protocol, in a secure channel. Basically what PEEP does is it authenticates servers using public and private key pairs. Uh, again, not mutual authentication, just server authentication. But you do have to provision the authentication server uh, certificate or the root CH certificate on the client. Uh, you're going to typically use PEEP uh, if you want to tunnel MSCHAP v2 or EPTLS inside and so on. 
All right, so what's the takeaway from all of this? You know, we talked about these two different methods. Uh, the key that you need to pick out from this is that these are going to be our outer tunneling methods, peep and eat fast. And then we can choose whatever inside tunneling method we want to use, whether it's, um, uh, you know, uh, gosh, any of the methods, right? Uh, EAP MS Chap V2, EAP TLS, EAP GTC. Those are typically going to be used for that inner tunnel process. All right. So it is uh, lunchtime. We're going to take our break. For those that are just watching the video, it'll start back up right where we picked up. Uh, where we left off but uh, for you guys uh, online we're going to go ahead and break for lunch about an hour maybe a little bit more than an hour come back uh, and we'll continue on with this very lengthy discussion about the extensible authentication protocol so uh, we looked at some of the different eat methods uh, the tunneling methods as well as the internal eat processes uh, when it comes to authentication one of the basic or, or kind of more of a traditional authentication process is where the user authentication works by basically treating the machine and the user as two separate and independent components in the authentication process. User authentication is performed when the user logs on. When the user logs off, the machine authentication gets performed. Uh, this traditional philosophy does not have the actual intelligence of evaluating the user authentication in combination with the machine authentication. And when it comes to, uh, basically when it comes to identifying users, traditionally that's always been done with, you know, with a st standard username or password. Uh, and then when it comes to identifying a machine, uh, that typically involved you know, some sort of certificate or some sort of machine-based authentication. Uh, the problem with this particular approach is that we don't have the ability to perform the additional enhanced machine authentication components that we're trying to perform, right? Doing the profiling against what type of computer it is and then also applying some sort of posture assessment and then maybe some remediation after we've identified that the particular posture of the machine isn't what we need it to be, right? So this traditional user and machine authentication, uh, even though it is supported on almost all of the common supplicants like AnyConnect, the network uh, uh, access module, the, the Windows native supplicant and so on, we may want to have other types of authentication involved in this. And this is where EAP chaining comes into play. Um, now, EAP chaining as a discussion can be quite an extensive uh, discussion. I mean, there's quite a, a, a lot of things that go into the concept of EAP chaining, and I don't know that we need to get into, you know, all of the details of it, but we certainly are going to talk about some of the, um, some of the components of EAP chaining. So what we're going to talk about is uh, this concept of EAP chaining. Uh, which kind of marries the whole idea of user authentication as well as machine authentication together. It is a feature that we can configure within ICE uh, to, to kind of combine both the machine and user authentication. Uh, and, and actually what happens is this authentication is performed inside of a single outer TLS tunnel. All right. Uh, eat fast is a protocol that we use to establish the outer tunnel. Remember, we have an option. We can choose PEEP or we can choose EAP fast. Uh, and then we specify what type of, um, what type of inner EAP authentication method we're going to use as part of the chaining process. So EAP chaining allows us to combine the results of whatever machine authentication and user authentication we might have into a single overall authentication result. Uh, let me um, kind of give you a, a little bit more background on this because obviously what we see on the slide here is, uh, is a, a basic description of the EAP chaining process. But uh, being that it's, well, number one, it's covered on the test quite a bit. So you're gonna have to understand this concept on the exam. 
But number two, it's something that we typically do use quite a bit in with uh, EAPFAST uh, and user authentication and machine authentication. So regarding the use of EAPFAST, uh, we can use Cisco AnyConnect Network Access Manager uh, and ICE to provide this EAP chaining concept. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about basic EAP, the EAP framework and what e EAPFAST is. We've already talked a little bit about what the Identity Services Engine is. Uh, we haven't really gotten into the specifics of the AnyConnect Network Access Module uh, or Network Access Manager but, uh, or Profile Editor, but we'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, and we've already talked about, you know, basic 802.1x services, all right? So uh, we already know that from basic discussion about EAPFAST, we know that this is a flexible EAP method. It's going to allow mutual auth authentication of a supplicant and an individual server, very similar to EAP PEEP but doesn't require the use of client or even server-side certificates. Remember, we use these packs to be able to supplement that process. We'll talk about that again in a little bit. One advantage of EAPFAST is the ability to chain multiple authentications inside in the inner method. That's what the diagram here is depicting to bind the, the basically together crypto, uh, cryptographically. Uh, and this is essentially what EAP chaining defines. Um, Cisco implementations use this for uh, the purposes of user and machine authentication. All right. We use uh, something instead of certificate-based authentication, we use something called protected access credentials uh, to quickly establish a TLS tunnel uh, and then to authorize the user or the machine uh, which allows us to skip the inner method for authentication. Like I said, there are three phases for EAPFAST. Phase zero, the pack provisioning. Phase one, the tunnel establishment phase, the TLS tunnel establishment phase, and then phase two, the authentication. All right. Uh, EAPFAST does support packless and pack-based conversations. Pack-based conversations consist of pack provisioning uh, and then a follow-on to that would be the pack-based authentication. Um, and then again, the, the, the pack-based provisioning can be based on either anonymous or authenticated TLS sessions. All right. I didn't really get into the specifics of pack. I mean, I mentioned a couple of things about the process a little bit. Um, but in order to understand this concept of EAP chaining, you really do need to understand in more detail how EAPFAST actually works. Uh, over, so we're creating this single TLS tunnel over which we can, under which we can pass the machine EAP and the user EAP uh, credentials, all right? But this is done with protected access credentials that are generated by the server. Those get provided to the client. Uh, what does the pack credential include? Uh, it includes some random secret value. It's called the pack key. Uh, that's pack key is actually used to derive the TLS master and session keys for the actual encryption. The pack opaque, which is called the pack, which is basically the pack key plus the user identity. Uh, this all gets encrypted by that server master key that was generated by the in the first set step, which is the pack key component, and then the pack info itself. The pack info is the server identity, uh, all the TLS timers that we're going to use for the session, and so on. So the server issues the pack that gets encrypted with the pack key and uh, identity using the EAPFAST master key, that's the pack opaque, sends that whole pack to the client. All right. Server doesn't keep or store any of that information except for maybe the master key, which is the same for every pack that gets generated. Uh, once the pack opaque is received on the client side, it gets decrypted using the EAPFAST server master key. It gets validated. And then that pack key is also used to derive the TLS master key and the session keys for the, the TLS tunnel and so on. So we have the tunnel pack, uh, which is used for basic 
the basic TLS tunnel establishment. Uh, we have a machine pack used for the tunnel establishment and machine authorization. We have the user authorization pack, which is used for uh, user authentication. Um, and then we have the machine authorization pack uh, for machine authentication, uh, if that's allowed by the server, by the way. And then finally, the TrustSec pack. Uh, I don't know. There's several documents on Cisco's website about this process, this uh, this pack process, and how it's generated and, and how it's managed. Um, we have some lessons on this a little bit later on as well, but uh, that's that's essentially what we're talking about when we talk about this EAP chaining operation. Although the slide in the book doesn't really go into a whole lot of detail on describing its function, uh, you need to know the general concept for the exam. You're going to have to understand what this this EAP, uh, EAP chaining concept is. All right. All right. Uh, EAP fast authentication occurs basically in two phases. Uh, in the first phase, EAP fast employs a T TLS handshake to provide all of the authentication key exchanges using TLVs to establish the protected tunnel. That's the outer tunnel that we're going to use to encapsulate everything internally. Uh, remember, a type length value field, I don't know if you guys have, have really seen this before, but uh, it's used in all kinds of protocols. TLVs are used in routing protocols and other types of protocols to transport information. It's basically a way of, of identifying generic compartmentalization of data. The type of the data, the length of the data, and then finally the value of data. So a TLV is basically just a generic container that allows us to, to process data. Uh, and it's not specific to EAP chaining. It's not specific to EAP fast. It's something that's used across a lot of different protocols. But these TL, uh, TLV objects are basically used to convey authentication related data between the client and the server. Once that tunnel is established, that outer EAP fast tunnel gets established, then we go in to move into the second phase where uh, the client and ICE engage in conversating about establishing the authentication and authorization policies. Uh, so we actually use an optional, uh, an optional identity type length value uh, and so on. So when the secure TLS tunnel has been established, the general EAP chaining flow, uh, which we saw in the previous diagram, that's what we saw in um, this diagram here where you have the machine and the user authentication starts to take place. All right. I sends over maybe optional identity type TLVs, machine or user TLVs, request identity of the client. The client responds back with the same TLVs or uh, and then the exchange uh, is done to essentially authenticate the, the client. This is what I was kind of describing previously when I talked about uh, the different types of packs, like the tunnel pack versus the machine pack versus user authorization versus machine authorization uh, and so on. That's what they're describing in this case. Uh, the, machine, the machine pack itself is sent within the TLS client hello message but the user authentication pack is sent inside the TLS tunnel using these TLVs. The machine authorization pack is also sent inside the TLS tunnel using these TLVs. Uh, and that's what they're describing essentially in the book and what they're describing on the slide here. All of these packs um, are delivered automatically in phase zero of the overall process. Uh, some of the packs themselves, like the tunnel pack, the machine pack, and the TrustSec pack, can also get delivered manually if you need to deliver them out of band. All right. When are these packs specifically generated? The tunnel pack itself is provisioned right after the successful authentication. That would be the inner method. Uh, if it wasn't previously used, um, the authorization pack is pr pr uh, provisioned after successful authentication as well. Uh, and then the machine pack is provisioned after successful machine authentication uh, and so on. So multiple steps 
of authentication are occurring here. And uh, all of this is being encapsulated inside of that EPFAST tunnel. All right. If we had to do all of these steps uniquely or separately, uh, it would be a lot more complicated. The process would be a lot more involved. But that's the whole point here is that we're able to chain these operations together. That's the whole concept of EAP chaining uh, and what EAP chaining provides. All right. What you're seeing in this particular diagram here is basically the EAP chaining flow. Uh, let's say an enterprise user attempts to access uh, you know, the network from a corporate managed endpoint. Right? The TLS tunnel gets successfully negotiated. ICE sends an identity type TLV with machine. That's the first part of the EAP chaining process. Uh, the ICE server recognizes whether the client supports EAP chaining by analyzing the response to the identity type TLV request. If that response contains a matching identity type TLV, then the client supports EAP chaining. In this particular example, the client matches both machine and user TLV requests, meaning that it is a corporate device. So we're going to authenticate the machine as well as the client. And then that, that uh, result is then presented to ICE uh, and um, the output is what you see at the bottom there. Eat chaining result equals user and machine both succeeded, which means we've authenticated both the user and the machine. Consequently, or subsequently, when the user logs off, uh, we see a similar process. Uh, this particular diagram here kind of illustrates that process. Uh, we see um, the EAP exchange for the user authentication. In this particular case, the supplicate actually returns a result TLV set to failure. Uh, that then allows ICE to accept the access request as a successful machine authentication with no user access. So we've authenticated the machine, but we haven't authenticated, I mean, we've authenticated the asset, but we haven't authenticated the user because the user has logged off. Uh, so somebody else can come use this asset, they can log in, and then they would have their user authentication um, authorized based on their identity, uh, but we didn't have to go back and re-authenticate the machine in this particular case because the machine identity was never changed, had never changed. So if you had a network that was um, um, you know, enterprise, you know, corporate network, like, you know, Cisco Wireless where you're doing um, you know, radius authentication for the user accounts could you do this so that the domain join machines could be able to you could log on to the machine with the domain authentication and have it carry over to the wireless or you mean if the machine moved from a wired to a wireless environment well like we have a lot of wireless laptops at work right and people would like to be able to use the laptops in classrooms and stuff without plugging in, but still access domain resources over wireless, which normally we don't do because the wireless is run by campus outside of the firewall. But I know what block of IPs that go on. I'm just leery about opening up domain controllers to machines that are outside of the network. What, what we do, Mike, is we have a, because with, with, with the, uh, uh, with ICE, you know, all, all, the, all the posturing, it goes through and it checks the, it checks to make sure that the antivirus is up to date, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it runs all that through any connect. Then, once that's done, once that's done, what we did is we made it so that uh, you get, you get like this 10 minutes uh, to make whatever corrections you have to make for, for the posturing. Uh, and then the network shuts off. Uh, but uh, if, if you pass all of your, all of your uh, checks, then you can VPN over the wireless. So I mean, while it's still you'll still have an internal IP address, uh, we put a we put the gateway on uh, our ASA, so then you can VPN into that gateway from internal, uh, and that's how we. And then you have access to the rest of like the corporate network. 
Well, the, the, the question that they ask, all right, so we have, um, are you familiar with Edge Room? No. Okay, Edge Room is basically um, uh, federated wireless across a lot of academic institutions. Okay. So I can take my credentials, go to another institution, and log into their wireless because it bounces back to my own home institution for authentication. But so we have Edge Room Wireless, and the students have we have loaner laptops that the students can borrow. So we're trying to figure a way to keep them updated and keep them patched and all that kind of stuff, which normally requires that they be on our network so they can get to our WIS server and stuff like that but still let the students log into them without having to plug in. So, you know, the students can authenticate against a student's domain, but that's not the same credential that they use for wireless. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But, um, but I don't think that so would, we're, I don't we're think trying to find a way that the machines can be on the wireless without being logged in. <laughs> Well, that's unrelated to what we're talking about here. Um, uh, you well, would—that's why I was wondering because it, we're talking about machine authentication and stuff. Well, when we when we talk about machine authentication, we're we're talking about authenticating a device based on its posture profile. Number one, is it a Windows machine? Is it a Macintosh? Is it? Uh, uh, you know, does it have this particular operating system and so on? And then also authorizing the machine based on its posture, right? Does it have the appropriate antivirus? Does it have the appropriate uh, patches on Windows and so on? And then there's a remediation component. So we're not necessarily authenticating the machine as an endpoint. Uh, we're authenticating the machine based on its posture, right? Okay. Uh, and, uh, and then secondarily, we're doing the user authentication uh, based on actual user credentials, right? Username, password, and so on. Right. So um, what they're what we're saying with the Eve chaining process is that we're com we're com we're completing both of those functions within one one Eep fast tunnel, rather than having two disparate functions that uh, that we have to process uniquely. So uh, a machine can be authorized or authenticated to the network one time. Uh, and then a user can log into that machine, the user would be authenticated and authorized. But if that user uh, logs out, if that user leaves and, and logs out of the network, the machine authorization doesn't have to change at that point because the machine was already authorized and authenticated. So another person comes in and logs into the computer, uh, we're simply applying the user authentication at that point, we're not doing the machine authentication again. Does that make okay. sense? So yeah. in, in your particular scenario, what you probably would want to look at is some, some, some way of providing authorization based on who's logging into the laptop. If it's a student logging into the laptop, then you're going to place that computer into a guest VLAN uh, or whatever. If it's an instructor or a teacher or whatever logging into the lap, a domain user logging into the laptop, then you're going to change the authorization level of that computer based on those credentials. But that's a basic function of ICE anyway, right? Uh, change of authorization based on who's actually authenticating. Right, I'm just trying to see, because normally we have them log into the account, into the laptop as a generic account, and then they can, and then they configure their wireless. Because since the machines aren't joined to the domain, they can't use their domain resources, and we weren't sure how to join them to the domain without them being plugged in, you know, because they wouldn't be able to log in if they can't reach the domain controller. Well, because your wireless network is completely separate, physically separate from your internal network, right? That's what you're right. saying? Right. Yeah. Well, you'd have to change that, right? You'd have to... You'd have to make it so the wireless network is actually part of your corporate network and then apply the appropriate security policies to authorize the devices based on authentication uh, and, uh, and filter that traffic that way. Instead of having a physical separation, have a logical separation that can change depending on who's authenticating. 
we're basically talking about a, a completely different uh, design methodology, essentially. Right. All right. Okay. I don't know, Andy, what do you think? I don't know, man. I kind of tuned you all out there for a little bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, at least you're honest. Okay. Least... I tune me out all the time. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, let's wrap up this lesson here. So, uh, if I'm using a personal asset, <coughs> with some sort of NAM component, the AnyConnect NAM component. Uh, uh, in this example, the client does not match the server's machine identity TLV request uh, since the device is not enrolled in the corporate domain. Authentication continues and matches on the server's user TLV request. Uh, deeming that it is a non-corporate device, the user authentication then is successful. The result is presented as Keep chaining result equals user succeeded and machine failed. Uh, now, keep in mind, in all three of these scenarios, right? We talked about this scenario here where we have a corporate, as corporate asset and a corporate user. So both the machine and the uh, user succeeded. So, uh, or in this case where the user logged off, the machine is still authenticated, but the user is not authenticated because the user logged off. Or in this scenario where uh, the user was able to authenticate, but it was not a corporate asset, so the machine was not authenticated. Remember, in all three of these scenarios, ultimately what we have to do is these are all just things that are reported to ICE, right? These are scenarios that are reported to ICE, and then ICE has to make a policy decision based on these scenarios. So it's actually... Uh, a secondary process that we haven't even seen or talked about yet is what do I do when these scenarios present themselves, right? How do I handle, uh, you know, authorization and, and um, access for these particular scenarios? We haven't talked about that piece yet. These are just different results from the EAPFAST slash, you know, inner EAP process where we're authenticating the machine or authenticating the user using these different packs. Uh, that eFast likes to use instead of the certificates and whatnot. So we're only getting half the story right now. We'll get the other half of the story in a future lesson a little bit down the road. Um, and uh, we'll, see, we'll see how we handle that scenario. So it is similar to what you're talking about, Mike, where you're, you're talking about having, it is a corporate asset, uh, but it's not necessarily, I mean, it's not a personal asset. Uh, so you should be able to do machine authentication, but then what you'd want to do is you'd want to have individual user authentication based on who's, who's credentialed to, into the system. My point is that you're probably going to have to look at changing your actual physical architecture to support connectivity as needed based on the different authentication scenarios. What you physically have in place right now is not sufficient to actually provide uh, that additional authorization that's necessary. If that makes sense. Right. Okay. All right. This last diagram out of the four that we've seen here is the EAP chaining flow when the enterprise user connects from a personal asset running a third party supplicant. Uh, there is no identity type TLV in the response. EAP chaining is not supported by the client. So we have to go through normal processing for the existing EAPFAST implementation as it applies. In this example, the client being maybe an Android tablet does not support EAP chaining. It continues with the EAPFAST authentication, uh, identifying itself as a non-corporate device. The result is going to be EAP chaining result equals no chaining. Uh, and then the user or the machine authentication have to succeed uh, using kind of the traditional EAPFAST V2 method Depending on the ICE policy, we're going to apply different appropriate access privileges uh, that are assigned to the endpoint. You know, and that's really the thing that I was mentioning previously that I think is important to understand is that we're, we are um, only identifying the ways that we can identify endpoints, user components and machine components, but we haven't really looked at the authorization piece, right? What do what's gonna happen after these results get sent back to, to ICE. Um, and that's really the part that we're missing. And we'll see that 
like I said, later on. All right. How do I connect? What kind of tool do I use to connect? Obviously, in the case of Cisco, the primary supplicant is the Cisco AnyConnect client. Um, it, uh, what we call the Cisco AnyConnect Secure Mobility Client. Uh, traditionally, this has been, quote unquote, a VPN client, but it includes a lot of other features. It's a 802.1x supplicant. Uh, it offers uh, downlink MACSEC pr uh, processes, uh, and uh, it does, uh, uh, mo it has several different modules incorporated into it, like the host scan module, the telemetry module, the cloud web security module. Uh, the host scan module itself uh, gives us the ability to identify or enumerate the operating system, uh, antivirus, anti-spyware, firewall software applications, and whatnot that are installed in the client. And then based on this pre-login evaluation, we can control how the host is allowed to communicate to the network, Am I going to do some sort of remediation for this particular uh, host and so on? So the host scan application um, is, uh, is actually delivered with the, the posture module and uh, it's the component of AnyConnect that does all of the posture assessment piece. Telemetry sends information about the origin of malicious content detected by antivirus software web filtering and so on, uh, URL filtering rules. And then finally, the, the Cloud Web Security module uh, allows us to proxy uh, services that go out to the web for the purposes of looking for malware, uh, acceptable use policies, you know, allowing, allowing communication based on whatever regulations or rules, rule sets that we put into place. All right. Uh, we're going to see, obviously, a lot more with the AnyConnect mobility, secure mobility client as we move on to some of the other lessons in the future. All right, so in summary, we talked about uh, 802.1x, what it is uh, as an IEEE standard uh, for media level access control. We talked about extensible authentication, uh, several different flavors of extensible authentication. We talked about the tunneling protocols like um, uh, EEPFAST and PEEP. Uh, and then we talked about MS Chat V2, EPGTC, uh, EPTLS, EPTTLS, and so on. Uh, and then also EAP chaining as a method of performing user and machine authentication inside of a single TLS tunnel, uh, basically combining those components together. So we have one more lesson in this uh, chapter in this module. Uh, in the next lesson, we're going to get into looking at the ICE configuration, right? How do I log into ICE? Uh, look at the kind of the different menus in the ICE GUI. Uh, take a look at network access devices, 802.1x, AAA, and so on. We'll even take a look at some of the global and port settings for monitor mode uh, and verify how authentication works in ICE and how to verify the authentication status of a switch and so on. All right, so we're going to take a look at that lesson next. We'll see you guys there.